All right, Sierra, how are you? I am great. How are you, Ryan? I'm I'm great. Thank you. Despite everything happening right now uh, in the news, um, but we're not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about your story and uh, one that I kind of like going into an episode because I like I don't know really anything about this this story. Um, so you know I'm going to be learning along with everybody else, but. Basically, um, from what I've gathered, you you self-described that you've or and we were just talking a bit off mic, but grew up as a Jehovah's Witness, um, but you're also kind of like a cult survivor, is I guess how I've seen you kind of define it on your social media. So I mean we can start like right at the beginning, uh, and then I'll just let you tell the story. Um what was what was your childhood like? What uh what was it like growing up in that type of environment? Um so being raised third generation i didn't know any better right so my life was good as i can remember um i didn't lack anything per se um it's only as i started to age was i starting to actually acquire some critical thought and seeing how certain individuals, especially really close friends of mine, how they were treated because they, you know, exuded some uh, more feminine tendencies as males and they were ostracized and made fun of and bullied. And I knew that any organization that was based on God is love, that really that, that didn't make sense to me because God is accepting of all, not based on gender and race and stuff like that when so i mean why don't we describe because i we all kind of know jehovah's witnesses as the people who at least regular people who show up at your door and try to like hand you pamphlets and are really kind of pushy and, and try to make their way in to, to talk about it um i remember yeah. as a kid they would all they'd come up to my house every week and drop off pamphlets and they started to know my name and i'm like yo i'm, I'm 16 and super angsty uh, I, i'm not doing any of this stuff um, but what, like, what is the, the general, I guess, religious sentiment of, of being a Jehovah's witness? Um, they believe, so they don't believe in the Trinity, like, um, LDS and stuff like that. They believe that Jesus is God's son and that, for example, something that really sets Jehovah's witnesses apart is that we don't have crosses we don't have anything of representation like that because in the scriptures it says do not make carved images of me do not worship there's a, a very different uh approach to jehovah's witnesses there uh but they believe that there will be a time so they believe that satan is on earth they don't believe that heaven or hell exists and heaven is only to be ascended upon by a specific group of people of the anointed and which is 144,000 people how they came up with that number and how they have deciphered who gets to go to heaven and who doesn't i don't necessarily understand that at all um but they believe that and have been preaching that armageddon is coming as you saw in my last post uh it's very control based, it's very fear based, and it's very patriarchal. So, for example, me being a female, my only privileges as a woman in the congregation would be to clean. So, I can't, I'm not allowed to give talks on the stage. I can address if a man is talking to me so I could have like a, a question answer part, kind of how we're doing right now. And you can speak to other women, they call it like a householder part. So you'd have two, uh, two women on stage and they'd be talking to each other about how you would approach it, a topic in the ministry. So knocking on doors as such. When, yeah. when you were growing up, was, um, were you like in school, like with, I guess like like a normal school system where you homeschooled. I, I remember growing up, we had one uh, person who who was in that was in as that, and like they they wouldn't um, 
like they seem normal in every sense, but like they wouldn't stand for the national anthem, um, didn't got to like leave the class when we celebrated holidays and birthdays and stuff like that, like kind of removed them apart. But like other than that, didn't really notice anything else. Were, were you situated with like the other children and had like a, like you said, kind of like a normal upbringing or were you removed from that in like a homeschool situation? I was homeschooled. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so you, all your friends were, were in this, like you really didn't have an understanding kind of what other kids were doing, yeah, like, supposed to be doing. The only outside association that I was granted that was not of cult members was uh, the kids that I played with on my street. And like, we were not allowed to go in their houses, uh, but we could play outside with them. So, um, go ahead. Continue. No, please. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so homeschooling was really interesting. Um, I'm one of five children and I'm the youngest. My two oldest siblings did attend school and my, my brother was having a hard time and the teacher was kind of emotionally abusive. So my mother pulled them out of school and kind of, it trickled down the whole line. Um, so I was homeschooled. Everybody in my family was homeschooled. And there was a point when my brother just older than me wanted to go to school. Uh, so he went and I attended grade eight. So I attended grade eight at uh, Terry Fox Elementary. And it's super funny because like one of the first things that kids said to me was you're homeschooled, but you're not weird. Like you can, you can socially interact with us. Little did they know they found out that I was very weird later, <laughs> but I, I found that that was super funny because they thought that I would be, you know, super closed off and not be able to communicate with you yet. I mean, we're trained to be able to knock on people's door and question them and try and incite conversation. So we know how to talk and we know how to, how to communicate. So, yeah. So as a child, what were like the things you would have to do in the name of, of you know, what the, you know, going to people's doors, like standing out on the street corner, like, like that type of stuff. It, it's one thing for adults to do it, but like when I look at, you know, even things like uh, uh, when people are protesting abortion, like the pro-life people, and they have their kids like holding the signs, you know, I'm like, man, like, it's one thing for you to do it, but to kind of indoctrinate your kid into this, it, it's very, I don't know, I, I don't agree with it personally. So like, what types of stuff, like, were you doing as a child uh, in the name of the cult of the religion, whatever? Honestly, like, um, going door to door, trying to convert all our friends and talk about stuff like that. Um, so when I was young, things have changed because obviously ec economies have changed. So the amount that people have to work in order to survive has increased. So they can't spend as much time at the meetings or in field service that they used to. So when I was young, there was three meetings. Well, they'd technically call it five meetings. So on Sunday, there'd be about two, two and a half hours where we would sit. One would be a symposium where he would just speak the whole time. And I would be sitting there looking at my scriptures, writing down notes. And then the second half would be a question and answer part, which I would have had to prepare. So I would spend, you know, at least an hour, hour and a half before that studying for that question and answer part, studying my scriptures, looking up that. Um, and then you'd have a short meeting during the week that would, was called a Bible study. And it was a smaller group of people generally held at someone's house. And so that was an hour. And again, it was another question answer part. So I'd spend another, spend another hour to hour and a half studying for that. Um, Wednesdays, we normally went in field service along with on Saturday mornings as well. Um, because we were homeschooled, we, we were all, we didn't have any restriction as to that. Right. So my mom generally took us out in field service on Wednesday. So you'd spend time preparing a presentation. So based on whatever watchtower and awake you were, uh, going to be speaking about you kind of needed to figure out what you wanted to bring bring out to that to the person at the doorstep 
and talk about. Um, and maybe you always wanted to like incorporate your Bible. So you wanted to pick a scripture and then read that to them. Uh, and then on Thursday night, there'd be another two part meeting, which it was kind of uh, some people would stand on the platform and they would speak about experiences and how how you should be addressing householders at the door when you are in the field ministry and then part the uh, there would also be a part where they were giving talks again. So that was basically our week. Very intensive. Yes, very intensive. What? And then like, sorry. I was just going to ask why, like, was the purpose, like the more you did, the more you were devote and the more studying, the more everything was like, was that supposed to guarantee you your, part in that like whatever I think you said the 144,000 people who are going to heaven or so they believe that um there's Armageddon is going to come on the earth and that Jehovah would uh will make the earth a paradise and those devote Jehovah's witnesses that have good hearts and those that have died will be resurrected to a paradise like earth and you'll live forever. So those that don't have the, the heavenly hope have the earthly hope. And so they've been preaching <laughs> ever since 1917 that uh, Armageddon is coming. And Armageddon was coming in the 60s, it was coming in the 70s, it was coming in the 80s. So it's just a perpetual cycle of fear. And especially when the pandemic hit, like that, they were like, these are the signs of the last days of the last days of the last days. That's how they put it. Because they, they've been so wrong in predicting the, the Armageddon coming that they just kind of like continual, continually circle around the subject. Do they have, is there like a, a specific event like that's supposed to happen? Like, are we, is it supposed to be an asteroid? Is like, um, you know, Satan's supposed to like take over and burn the world? Like, or is it just like it's it's gonna happen and like and then they, they just kind of use whatever's happening to like fit into the narrative? So the scripture that set that brings apart that there's gonna be famine and food shortages and natural disasters. So they use that to 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 you know say, yeah. oh well, like this is happening all over here. So it's the sign that it's it's coming. They don't they believe that Satan is on earth already tor tormenting us. Which I mean, if you look at the news, it doesn't seem too far off, but who knows? No, no, yeah. Um, so why, why convert? Why is that such a, seem to be like such a you know, integral part of this, this cult that they are constantly out trying to bring people into it? Because you're, to be fair, like, and real, they, the more people that you convert, the higher you are, basically, like, the more people respect you, and the more that they, you know, think that you're really aligned with uh, the scriptures and the teachings. It's like an MLM. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, basically, it is, and that's, so they, they just continue to, to, to do this and if you're not in the field service so they have um it's called a uh, field service report i don't know if it's changed mm. but you write down how many people you spoke to you write down how many people that you're going to return to you write down how many watchtowers you gave how much time you spoke to them how many bible studies you have and they keep track of that monthly so okay that makes like sense so one time they came to the door and my mom actually entertained them, like brought them in and gave them tea. And like, once that happened, they were there like so much more. All so the they time. Could, they could like, they're like, we're so because close to closing the deal. You became a return visit. Oh God. <laughs> yeah. So I was like, yeah. mom, why did you do this? She's like, I don't know. I just wanted to hear what they had to say. I'm like, oh God. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So Okay, so like the way you've described it, I mean, yes, there seems to be some like very 
kind of like red flags, you know, with the the conversion and and the kind of brainwashing as as the kids are growing growing up. But like, would you define this cult? Like, is it good? Is it bad? You know, you said people with good hearts are going to stay on Earth, um, as as what they believe and, and live forever in paradise. So, you'd think that they would have good hearts on, like, and like be good people, just believe this funky thing. So, like, inherently, is this like good or is it is it bad? I think that anyone that chooses to only have men in power and to only listen to men and to not listen to women and to not listen to children. For example, um, they actually are losing their tax exemption in Australia because there was over a thousand cases of child sex abuse that went unreported. Mm -hmm. And so the Australian commission, they signed, they, they put something together for these organizations to sign on to, to say that they would pay compensation to to child sex abuse survivors and Jehovah's Witnesses refuse to sign on to it. So they're now receiving, um, ta- they're now getting their tax exemption revoked. Um, to go a little bit into my story, mm. I, I have struggled with mental illness from as young as I can remember, to be honest with you. Um, fear, that fear-based walking on the street, am I going to get assaulted? Am I going to get beaten? Am I going to get robbed? That's how they keep you in there, right? Because no one outside is safe. Everyone outside are are worldly, they're unbelievers, and they're just out to get you. Um, So I have struggled with anxiety and depression. And only now, after leaving and in my teen years and in my adult years, did I understand that that's what was happening to me when I was younger, you know, my mom would be like, I don't know why you sleep for 14 hours. Like, we're going to get you like a tonic or something to like, or an, a, like a, a natural drink, because obviously you're not getting the vitamins and minerals that you need if you're sleeping for hours on end. Little did we know it was depression, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a narrative in the organization, and it's about uh, putting on the new personality. So there's this constant narrative of being better and doing more. So your worth, your worth just diminishes. And as a woman, when you have literally nothing to look forward to other than getting married and bearing children, like to me, that was never something that I wanted that never resonated with me at all. I never wanted to just be a vessel. Um, so I was sexually assaulted in my teens and what has to happen is you go into a judicial committee meeting. So me as a teen girl, there I am sitting in a room with three middle-aged white men and they're asking me intimate questions about what happened to me. If I screamed seven times, if I did this and if I did that because they also have this rule um, it's called a two witness rule so what that means is you have the victim you have the perpetrator and then you have a third person that needs to to see the event happen in order for them to acknowledge that it happened so it's a constant cycle of victim blaming so you, you're in that room as a as a 14 year or as a <clears throat> a teen and you know they're asking you, oh well, obviously if you didn't scream that many times, you must have liked it. And yeah, it's just a <sighs> after that happened, um <clears throat> they privately reproved me. Which what means is, they okay. took away they took away my privileges in the congregation. So I was no longer allowed to comment and do the small privileges that I had as a woman, right? So I wasn't allowed to comment and that's really when my mental health took a massive hit. 
I, through when I, when I started going to school in grade eight, I was suffering from an eating disorder and that kind of hit its peak when this happened. Um, I started therapy, but my dad was like, mm, well, it's really expensive. Do you think that you need it? Or should you just like pray more and study more and Jehovah will help you? Yeah. So you can see how the cycle of abuse could easily spiral out of control. Like what happened in Australia there, where if you're expecting that third witness to corroborate whatever happened, but like you have, you know, those victim crimes where there's the victim and, and the, you know, victimizer, like how are you ever supposed to seek justice at all? Um, so and you, there's, there's also, there's also parts in the organization that say that you should never like accuse another individual in the congregation. And like, this is, this experience is so not single to me, like so many women and males in the organization have the exact same story as me. Right. And that's, that's really where my issue lies is that <clears throat> they won't bring it to the police. They'll hide it under the rug or they'll just move the brother that did that to another congregation and then not tell the congregation and he will repeat his cycle of abuse. <clears throat> right. So, so they protect they protect the the perpetrator and they do not protect victims. And not only not protect, but then, you know, kind of like destroy your life, right? Like if this is all you know and this has been your yeah. whole life and all of a sudden they're taking away like the few, like you said, the few kind of privileges you have of, as a woman in this that like, and now they're like, okay, well, this happened to you. So you're already dealing with the trauma, already dealing with, you know, all the, the feelings that happen with the mental illness. And then they're taking away like the aspects of your life that may be the only things you could look forward to. And now you, you're left at nothing. And so the other thing is, although I was privately reproved, um, like one of the people in the meeting, he was uh, like one of my closest friends' dad. So I basically became blacklisted with my friends and they were like, you probably shouldn't associate with her. So the few friends that I had after that, you know, it became a struggle to want to stay. And um, so I, tr I left for a little period of time. So I actually found strength training when I was just at the tail end of 17. And I had a personal trainer for like six sessions. And he was like, why don't you do this as a job? And I was like, what, really? And he was, I was like, I don't have a high school diploma because the other thing is my parents allowed me to be pulled out of school so I only have a grade eight equivalent. And I was really only taught math, English, uh, and science homeschooling. So I was done like a massive disservice there in my education level. So <clears throat> thank God for that personal trainer. So I, I, I went and I, I studied for it and I, I met, some, met the, the fitness manager and she hired me. And that actually changed everything. Uh, it created this sense of worth that I had been lacking for my entire life, right? Like I had masochistic tendencies, I, you know, like suffered with an eating disorder. And my value was just like, I was a shell of a human being. Um, so during that period of time, while I was trying to build my clientele, it's, it's hard to do and you have to devote so much time. So I was missing meetings and missing field service and spending more time doing that. And so that created an issue with my family. So I moved out for a short period of time, uh, kicked out, moved out, same thing. <laughs> so, as I was doing that, um, 
some other things transpired, uh, like stress, I had to go on stress leave because it was just too much. I don't, working, you know, 60, 70 hour weeks with someone who suffers from complex PTSD, which I didn't know at the time, it, it was just draining me so severely that I just wasn't able to function and I wasn't able to hold my, my temper. And I just like emotional regulation was just so not there. So I ended up um, moving back in with my parents and I like dove head first back into the organization. And I was like, you know what? Like, I'm going to try really, really hard. Obviously, maybe I just wasn't trying hard enough. Um, so I dove back in <clears throat> and then I started noticing that I couldn't even be at the church and around people. Like what would happen is as soon as the meeting would start, I'd come in and I'd sit in the back. It was called the second school away from everybody. I would attend it and then I would leave not associating with anybody. And now as I think about it, my energy and my nervous system, my body was trying to protect me. My body was like, you don't need to be there. Like this isn't helping you. Um, and they have these things uh, throughout the year called uh, conventions. They, ho they host them in Cornwall normally and they're like three day conventions. And I was getting to a point where I couldn't even attend those three days. Like I'd have to attend one day and then sleep the entire next day to recover. And that was just, it was just taking so much out of me as a person. Um, I got back into uh, training and like personal training after stress leave. And I went from a, went to a smaller smaller, more like mom and pop gym style. And that was super great uh, until I had like an emotional relapse and I took a lot of pills and I tried to kill myself. And that was in the tail end of 2013. And from then I finally actually got some help that I greatly needed from outpatient therapy for six months. And there's this narrative in the in the the uh, the cult that they don't want you to seek help, mental help, mm. and only maybe in the past like five to ten years have they been okay if somebody attends therapy, because they they know that the therapists are going to be like, this is what's creating all of this worthlessness in you. Um, so when I when I was hospitalized, they finally diagnosed me with PTSD and borderline personality disorder and adjustment disorder. Um, so luckily, like I, I did some dialectic behavior therapy with my outpatient and that was super successful with um, giving me some tools to emotionally regulate because I have been in fight mode my entire life. So anger is my number one emotion mm. <laughs> growing growing up as you know i'm the youngest i'm the youngest and there was three boys older than me so that was just a a trait that i got from them and growing up with three older brothers and being the tomboy that i was you know you're not allowed to burp sierra you're not allowed to fart you like the boys can do that but you can't do that and i was like I was like, that doesn't, that's not okay with me. Why can't I wear suits to the church? Because the boys get to do it. It's way more fun. And like, I can at least play outside after. Mm. No, you've got to be a lady. I, you know, a lot of things uh, from, from kind of what you said. And um, it was 2012 when, you know, I went through my lowest episode and tried to take my life. So around that time as well for, for me. Um, I was going to ask like the view of mental illness uh, in, in this, because, uh, and you, I'm glad you, you kind of touched on that because, you know, you mentioned leaving, coming back, kind of leaving again and, and 
you know, all these different things, like the process of leaving, you know, I, I, I don't want to compare it to other things, but when you hear about, you know, trying to leave Scientology, how complex and difficult it is. And once you're out, like there's no coming back. So obviously they're okay with you trying to like figure out the, the way yourself, or is it, is it more like, you know, the relationship with your family, like you mentioned kind of getting kicked out, moving out, like take me through a little bit of that, that process of leaving and coming back and what that was like. Uh, my dad pretty much like did not talk to me. Basically my, my relationship with my father after that moment was very uh, distant, I would say. I think he blamed himself, you know, as a father would for uh, the sexual abuse that I went through, um, that he couldn't protect me. Um, and so the other part is uh, my siblings were all in it at the time. So certain siblings didn't talk to me. Um, my relationship with my mother, though, developed a lot better when I was out because she just wanted to help me and she just wanted me back basically right so that was nice for however long that lasted for my sister I continued kind of a relationship with her for a short period of time but there's something that needs to be said about being in this organization you're constantly being compared to other people as much as they don't say that so she's one of the most toxic humans that I know. It's constantly talking shit about everybody around her in her congregation. And it's just like, it got to a point where I was giving too much in our relationship and there was nothing, I wasn't treated with respect and dignity that I deserved to be treated with. And so I kind of just, walked away from that relationship on my own. And so that's been two years. Um, and my parents and I haven't had any meaningful conversation for three years. Yeah, so everybody that I, I knew, grew up with, you know, lived, lived my life with, and they're all still in Ottawa, because that's where I was born and raised, uh, I'll see some people outside and they just, they ignore you. They don't look at you like even, like if you're, that you're even a human being, you know, <clears throat> my middle brother though, he walked away around the same time that I walked away the second time. And it's been incredible having him in my life. You know, I don't know what it would be like if I didn't have him and the few friends that are ex XJWs as well, because um, although my partner is ex Mormon, <laughs> which is funny, and also ra uh, raised, he is uh, one of six children. He doesn't not have the same experience anywhere close to the same experience that I had in in our in that cult yeah so, it's hard yeah. to compare all the different things i mean i know nothing about any of these organizations but they say mormons are usually like the nicest cult that you can have <laughs> i mean so i mean that's just what i've heard but um you know the would you say I, i'm going to refer to them as the jw's now because i like that it's a lot easier but yeah would you say it's growing? Would you say with the rise of, you know, now people like yourself who are leaving, um, young people with the rise of like social media and, and you see with young people already with more acceptance of, you know, we're, we're talking about being anti-racist. We're talking about LGBT issues uh, and more non-binary and, and queer people and all those different things. Like the younger generation is just so much more aware. We're, we're aware of what's happening in this world. So would you say like, the JWs in this belief system, like, is it slowly receding? Is it slowly going away with the younger generation? Because I know how hard it is when you're indoctrinated as a child to this belief yeah. system. So 
I'm going to tell you that nowhere where you look online will it ever say that they're decreasing. I, with what I follow, with the knowledge that I know about how many kingdom halls are being shut down and consolidated and be, the properties being sold off, I want to tell you that, yeah, they're their numbers are not increasing. They're, they have to be diminishing at this point. Um, because like you said, yeah, like there is way more access to, to information uh, about all of this culture that, especially the patriarchy, like it is so, <laughs> wow. It is so insane that like, that's, that's why I'm, in search of starting my own support group for, you know, ex fundamentalists and those leaving to su to support them because I don't want little girls in this organization, you know, struggling the way that I struggled and not having the strength to be able to leave and, you know, taking their own life. And it's just like, you're worth a lot more than just getting married and just being a mother you can add so much more to this world with your presence than just those two things absolutely and i think you know while we still have a long way to go the last couple of years the the potential has increased uh you know exponentially in ways where organizations are starting to be pressured into creating more opportunities for for women and and, and all that what's it i guess I mean, it's hard to say with, with throughout the world, but like, what is, there's the patriarchal system, but like when we're talking about, you know, um, like black people, uh, you know, other racialized minorities, LGBT, I know we kind of touched on, on the, on the start, but what, what is like the general feeling when it, when it comes to like that part of the structural structure of the organization? So I think there is some deep seated racism in there um like the governing body is i believe all white males so the governing body is like i think there's seven or eight of them they sit in toronto and they make all the rules and they come out with publication new publications and new rules and things like that and some things have adapted over the years like um jehovah's witnesses have always abstain from blood and they have um, started to kind of like change things in the sense that they will now are okay with fractions like a cell salvage machine where they like they they take your own blood they clean it they recycle it and they give it back to you but that's a personal decision <clears throat> lgbtq no absolutely mm. not they are horrendous human beings to those people and right. and that's and i think you know um there's so much hate to be an organization that is centered on the fact that god is love there is so much hate you are taught to hate everyone who is not a Jehovah's Witness. You are taught to look down upon everyone and not pay them any mind. And, but they'll, they'll tell you that that's not true. But living, you know, living in this society now and seeing human rights issues and seeing, like I'm a massive supporter of that. And that's only happened in the past five years as I've left as I've seen what his, like what the world is really like and not this closed off bubble, it hurts me in my heart to ever think that I was that person that looked down upon people that were not of that faith, you know? And it's so dehumanizing, yeah. It, uh, it takes me back to a, a podcast I was listening to I think her name is Emma Phelps or Jennifer Phelps anyway she was raised as a um as a what you, the Baptist church or, or whatever the one that in America that's like yeah, yeah, super yeah. super out there and huh? she 
similar story to you where she, she grew up, she grew up in all this. And then it was this person on social media one day who was like questioning her that made her start questioning it. Now she's out and kind of speaks out against yeah. like, and it's a very similar story like that, where you're brought up to hate all these people. And it's the great hypocrisy of almost any religion um, where yeah. it's centered around love and God's love and acceptance. And yet, you know, there's, there's people who some, for some reason interpreted as only love of this or that. And everyone else is like, you know, fuck them basically. And, and not Absolutely. only fuck them, but like actively go at them to convert them or, you know, change them in, in the way they are. And it, it to me, that's always been your doorstop <laughs> or show up at your, your doorstep and say, Oh, you're gay. Well, do you know that God's going to kill you in Armageddon <laughs> and that the reasons for, you know what I mean? And you're just like, no wow like that's I've seen that happen and it's so like I said dehumanizing the the audacity <laughs> it's, it's right you know like uh, I anyway but I I, I want to get into like kind of where you're at now because obviously you, you you live this life we've heard you know bits and pieces of it I'm, I know it's not the whole story but now you're you're such a I mean, I've only, we've only been connected for a couple of weeks and only, I've only been following you on social media for a little while, but like, you know, you live this life and, and speak of, you know, this, this purpose, you know, this acceptance and, and very thoughtful posts about, you know, a bunch of different things, mental health and, and, and everything. But like, what, what turned you into coming out of this situation where you were so victimized into becoming sort of like this force of empowerment and strength? Uh, I would have to give, I think the root and the foundation of that is uh, strength training. Me hmm. being able to really? find that. Yeah, me being able to find that and no longer focusing on like what my body looked like uh, and how pleasing I was to men so that I could get a mate. Uh, it, lit this fire in me that was already there because this personality has always been inside of me but just so so smothered um that it showed me that you know i was strong i was powerful and i was capable of doing so many things i was told i wasn't allowed to do and that that has empowered me so much like I said about, you know, other little girls in this organization that I think about and I hurt for them. And I hope that, you know, they're, they're doing their research because the internet wasn't necessarily around when I was a kid. Because you're told you're not allowed to look at any other things that are not like publications from the organization because of apostasy. What is that? Uh, sorry, what is apostasy? Uh, where you oppose, where you speak uh, opposing oh. views. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So, so I'm considered an apostate at this point. Mm. Mm. So like, so, yeah. are you kind of like allowed social media? I, I, so, I mean, when you were growing up, we didn't like, you know, social media wasn't like yeah. as big of a force as it is now. Like, are they like, like no cell phones, like kids, like you're just carrying around the, the watchtower book. Or, or no, like, I think to Rome. I think they're free to do as they please. And you know what? Like, I feel like if they have TikTok, I hope that they're getting super educated <laughs> on the fact that there's way more out there than what what is closed off. And like you said, the the awareness. You know, we we see all these boomers and older generations say how you know millennials and gen z are uh were snowflakes and i was like you know what i was like the thing is we're not we're actually in touch with our being and our centers and we empathize with other humans that are going through things because we are aware and we're not closed off the way that you were, you know, and the way that you suppressed your emotions. 
boys aren't boys aren't allowed to cry boys aren't allowed to do this girls aren't allowed to do this we're not in those freaking boxes anymore we have breaking those boxes apart and been like we're going to do whatever we want however we want and you just have to accept us for that and i think that that's the best thing possible for this world because humanity as we see it dwindles so much when those older generations are in power and then you see you know when when uh, gen z did all that stuff to trump how they like changed all his uh the uh all the gen z bought like tickets to his rallies yeah, his so when rallies, he showed yeah. up at his rallies yeah exactly where they're like nobody like we just don't we don't want to spread hate anymore it it to me when it first started happening and this is like a big thing of i guess toxic masculinity but like you know back in 2016 2017 when kind of like i don't know i whatever for whatever reason i don't know if you agree but like when trump got elected there just seemed to be an acceleration on especially social media where just the amount of information coming from people who didn't have a voice before it just it seemed to just go off now i always attribute that I, so i i'm a, i love history i love reading about history i love watching history documentaries all that stuff and it, after a while i come to realize that like none of this is new information people have been talking about this for decades if you go watch a documentary on the 60s you're like wow everything they're talking about there like we're still talking about now whether that's you know racism or lgbt issues quality for women yeah. yeah like this was like all happening then and we're still having this conversation now so it's not new we just we're not we don't have gatekeepers in the media but the amount of information i get now especially 2018 2019 last year 2020 uh from things like tiktok from now even instagram reels is just like it, it's opened my the pathways in my brain to being so open and critical of myself and my thoughts uh, to, to these new ways of thinking and ideas. And, you know, my mission for this year is like, especially for men to like break down this resistance that we for some reason have and, and get defensive about when people are just talking about normal things and like I go back to when Harry Styles was wearing the dress and all the guys were like fucking having a meltdown I'm like it literally affects you zero percent zero percent and and sorry like Harry Styles is probably like he is a sex icon like people like he is more masculine than you will ever be in your entire life and you're chirping him for wearing a dress like fuck off you know and it just opened my mind I'm like you know this like this shit needs to stop I see grown ass men crying on social media because the world juniors lost in the gold medal game, like having a fucking breakdown. I'm like, this is, I can't anymore. Like I, I need to talk to men and especially young teens and boys. I've already been doing it with mental health. Uh, but like even just these, these toxic elements of society, of our, of our personalities of being so defensive when anyone doesn't want to drive a pickup truck and wear a fucking lumberjack jacket. It's ridiculous that reminds me of a, a book that so you'll you'll laugh at this my brother that's not in the organization anymore he sent it to me because he was like sierra i actually think that this book would resonate heavily with you and it's called uh the mask of masculinity the masks mm. of masculinity and lewis hall is over there um and it talks about you know the athlete mask the the Joker mask, the aggression, uh, aggressor mask. That was the mask that I used for majority of my life. I have always been highly aggressive. Little did I know that was just a trauma response and I've just been in fight mode my entire life. <laughs> um, but it's so funny that you speak about this because my partner is so not that. Um, he is uh his like his best squat is over 650 pounds he 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 snatches over 350 pounds he clean and jerks over 450 pounds and majority of the summer he's in like a sarong like he, like he wear he i admire his level of open vulnerability we watch movies he's the one crying 
and I'm not because I feel uncomfortable about crying because I feel uncomfortable about expressing that weak emotion, right? That, that toxic trait that I still have in me. And I am so blessed to, you know, have him in my life that, that he's grown up. He was a, he was an athlete his whole life and a football player. Uh, he was in track. He was an Olympic weightlifter and yet he's, so soft, so caring, and one of the kindest people I know, and it does not fit that narrative of toxic masculinity. It is, it's a blessing. Especially for like, you know, a guy like that, most people would just assume he'd be a, like a meathead, like quote unquote meathead, you know, oh, just dumb I'm Jim more bro. of the meathead. <laughs> I'm more <laughs> of the meathead. <laughs> but uh, you know, I, I, I go to the summer, um, I, I went through a super bad depression when the lockdowns first hit. And then like right on top of that, I went through a breakup and I was just having a rough time with a lot of things. And I found like joy in musicals. And this is something, you know, back in my teen years, my brother uh, who's gay, he, he loved musicals and I would like chirp him relentlessly for liking musicals. And now he's like, chirping me for like being an asshole as a teenager and now I'm like singing every word to the greatest showman and going back to like the set I was like you know that uh, was a great movie that was great fucking and a great soundtrack there not nothing gets me yeah. more fired up than the theme song the greatest show during a workout I'm like let's <laughs> like let's do this but you know and I love it I just I think and this is what I, I I just personally want to start getting out to people is like what you do what you wear what you like is not an, a, an assault on how much of a man you are. I, I can go and dance to Zendaya and Zac Efron and sing every word. Then I can go out and fucking chop some wood and, and you know, lift a heavy thing and be like, you know, right? Like, doesn't make me any yeah. less of a man. And it, it's just, it's funny that we're still under this notion, even in 2020, that, you know, whatever, like, it, and- I'm just, yeah, like, it is it's it, like we're still trapped in that and I'm currently just starting to like explore energies and and that like you have feminine energy in you and you have masculine energy in you same with me and like we just need to be able to honor those parts of ourselves and feel free to you know give them out towards people uh it's funny that you do say that about like a support group and men so that my brother that that recommended that book he does have a kind of like a support group for men in Ottawa it's called the grounded man project and it's a safe space for men to um you know have support and feel your feels and you know be be vulnerable and be whatever you need in that moment around men that are ex-military and ex-athletes or still athletes just they're creating that safe space and you know like he's he's a huge inspiration uh Spencer my partner has attended some of them and he was just like I loved it it was you know incredible I wrote that down as you could see I'm like scrambling <laughs> for my pen I'm like okay this is interesting uh yeah <laughs> um you know yeah no that that's great that there are men who are out there. And I think, you know, I've learned from talking about mental health from years, how much we can just make an impact with young people, whether it's about what we're talking about now, or even going back to, you know, your story and, and young women is, and, and accepting yourself and, and all these different things being strong and, and it has no bearing or impact on, on who you are as a person. Um, and, yeah. and, you know, the things you can accomplish in this life, like it's, it's kind of corny and cheesy, but like, if you believe in yourself, I mean, I'm not saying you can do anything, but like just believing in who you are as a person is just such a freeing feeling, like the, the weight it, off of you. And investing amazing. in yourself and, you know, like there's so much stigma behind mental health and yes, it's changing, but it's still not, it's not changing fast enough. And, mm -hmm. um, 2018, I found myself in a really, really low place and I had relapsed in my self-harm and I knew that if I didn't get help, that 
I probably wasn't going to live the rest of that year. So I finally, I consulted and I found an incredible uh, therapist who specializes in trauma. And she changed, she's changed my do diagnoses. Um, I don't actually necessarily fit the criteria for DPD anymore because of how much work I've been able to do on myself. Uh, and she changed my diagnoses from PTSD to complex PTSD because there's still nothing out there that recognizes the trauma of uh, being in a fundamentalist religion mm -hmm. or being in a cult because it's not, you're raised, which is so sad, you're raised on conditional love on the condition that you attend meetings and on the condition that you are one of Jehovah's Witnesses. And that that was something I think that like broke me my entire life was knowing that, and that's what, what keeps people trapped is they know that if they leave, they don't have anything left. Their parents aren't gonna talk to them again. Their friends aren't gonna talk to them again. And, um, being able to have, you know, we know that searching for therapy and paying for therapy is uh, very financially expensive, greatly expensive. Mm -hmm. um, I don't regret spending the thousands of dollars that I have for the past, you know, year and a half, almost two years, because I've regained my life back, you know, and I'm at a point where I'm finally starting to not like my nervous system is finally starting to let go of that fight mode and to be able to feel joy and feel happiness when those are not things that I've ever experienced because of being so closed off and being so scared all of the time. So, yeah. Great, a great point that like we don't recognize the, you know, the, the traumas of growing up in a fundamentalist. And I think we're even going to see it as we progress. We're, we're talking about the, the religious, but I think, you know, even far right kind of ideologies, like you were talking a little bit off mic and what's happening in the news. But as we record this yesterday is when the Capitol was stormed in the States. Um, wow. but you, you think about the, the kids who are being raised under Trumpism or under this far right ideology that's raised on whether it's white supremacy or, or hate, like it's going to be the same thing that's going to happen to them that kind of happened to you in, in this and other people who've grown up in the religious part of it. It's, it's still very much the same thing. They're going to be, they're raised on this, this ideology and this belief and they're going to rate, like get up and they're going to be like, like grow up and they're like oh this shit isn't right like I was a t terrible person and all the things I believed were terrible and you know we're gonna have to deal with this as a society of of getting people out of that ideology as well it honestly yeah um but like you said and like we've talked about is that these kids these kids feel empathy and I think that alone has puts them in a way better position, right? Mm -hmm. They're exposed to more things. And luckily, if they are going to school, they're experiencing other things. But because of how closed off I was and sheltered, I was never able to, you know, experience these things. I still haven't traveled the world like I should have mm -hmm. or need to do. And my hope really is, uh, my my partner's youngest sister she's actually 10 years younger uh, so she's gen z and i was checking in with her because they're american he's an american mm. yeah so he's from california i somehow like wrangled him in and got him to move to canada <laughs> um and so i was just checking in with her yesterday or today and just like hey how are you doing and she was like you know what I've been talking to a lot of my friends in this generation and we are all doing okay because we have all seen this happening for years. Like they, they have grown up in this traumatic environment of seeing how decisive the world is, right? 
and she's like so I'm dealing my mental health as well and you know which is which I think a lot of the older generation they're the ones that are struggling like like you said at the beginning of the pandemic which I was I'm sorry to hear that you were struggling a lot then I found it to be the point in which I was able to finally start healing my own body because mm-hmm. I wasn't I wasn't having to give my energy out I was able to come back to myself and start working on that stuff that I had been frantically running around trying to um you know put food on the table and make sure that everything was okay and now I was finally able to come back to myself and so I'm really hoping that you know they see the example that that is in the media and that they understand that that that's terrorism and that we don't that that doesn't resonate with who they want to be as a person right you know you don't you hope that that kids are looking at this and they're going what in the world can can we get an adult for our our adults please right yeah i need adult sitters (laughs) instead of babysitters um so you mentioned kind of the support group like what's what's next for you what's what's your goals is there a larger purpose do you think to help more people or is it more just to really heal yourself and and figure out you know all the things that you want and, and want to accomplish with the rest of your life so it's funny that you say that my last therapy session of 2020 was I was sitting there with my therapist and I was like you know what I've done I've done so much work on me and I feel like now my work is for the collective it needs, I, I want to su- start a support group. Like I want to elicit some support for people that are struggling and that maybe aren't in a po- position or a place where they're grounded enough to know, you know, that they, they have that power to leave if they need to, or that they have support from people around them that love and cherish them and empathize with how they were raised and the trauma that they've experienced. And uh, with strength training, we're currently working on a website because my partner and I are running, now running our own business because we lost our jobs in the pandemic because the gym that I had been running for six years shut down, a blessing in disguise. Um, and so we're currently working on that. And he is an incredible youth coach so I don't know if you've ever seen her she's on she's like taken over Instagram she's seven years old and she's like an incredible gymnast and weightlifter so that's my my partner's little prodigy let's call it so we're now building we're building a youth performance program uh to hopefully be able to help parents currently that are, you know, at home with their children that can't, you know, that don't know what to do to get them to move, get them to be active and just, yeah, go from there. That's amazing. I'm excited. Well, yeah, that's, yeah, that sounds so cool. You'll have to share that with me when it, when it's all ready to go and I help spread the yeah. word because uh, that's, that's good. And, you know, with the lockdowns and, you know, Quebec just put in a curfew and who knows what Ontario is wow. going to do. Like, the biggest thing and I'm like you I found a lot of um help I guess I'll use simply in fitness uh and and working out and challenging myself and setting goals not physical goals but like mental kind of goals and then now after the pandemic and doing it so consistently because I literally have nothing else to do but that work and podcast like I'm like seeing the physical results now I'm like oh okay yeah let's keep going (laughs) So, so that's great. Um, listen, thank you so much for sharing the story uh, and, and your energy. Um, I always kind of, I don't I feel bad like talking about traumatic experiences with people. So I, I really appreciate you kind of going through that and, and reliving some of it because I, I know it's tough, but you know, it is really important to share that kind of stuff with people and they, they can recognize it. Yeah, no, honestly, thank you for having me. I think that the more that I speak about it, 
the less power I give to those horrible people. And I reclaim the story that is my own and my own narrative and my own power in order to, you know, move forward with my life and no longer be held in the past. So I think of if I hold this inside me and I'm not open to sharing, then I can, then I'm just tying myself to the past and I'm just never able to, to move forward in my life. So I'm just super happy and grateful for you to have asked me to be here. It's great. It, a great point. And it was my absolute privilege. I know you have a great Instagram. I don't know if you have other social media that people can go check you out and then stay up to date on the new business updates. Uh, yeah. Where can we follow you? Uh, Sierra uh, at Sierra MM. So C I E R R A M M at uh, Instagram. Perfect. Okay. Sierra, thank, thank you so much. Uh, keep up the great work and uh, look forward to uh, catching up down the road for sure. Awesome. Thanks so much.